Good morning. Before we continue on this morning, I want to take just a, a couple of minutes and I want to share with you uh, an opportunity that we actually began last Wednesday night for adults. Uh, if you remember, a week ago we had uh, bad weather and so no services last Sunday and on Wednesday we began a new Bible study. And for the past couple of years, in January and the first part of February, we have done a four-week semester of what we call the counterculture series, where we deal with issues of sexuality and faith that affect the church today. And last Wednesday night, we continued that series uh, with a new four-week study called Grace Truth. And I want to show you a short trailer that will give you kind of a, a sense of what we began to cover last Wednesday night and what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. And so uh, let's watch this video together. I believe that Jesus was the perfect embodiment of truth and love because a theology of love without the truth isn't actually loving. And a theology of truth without the love isn't actually truthful. When Jesus loved people, he loved them into the truth. The way I always start out my story is the way lots of people start out their stories, and that's to say that from the time they were a little kid, they knew they were different. I can remember what it felt like to sit in that office and to be so afraid and to feel so hot and trembly and to not even be able to look at my father or mother in the face, but to have to tell them this thing that I was experiencing. They said, look, this is something I'm battling. I don't know what to do with it. And I was escorted out of the church and um, invited to never come back. And I didn't for 18 years. I didn't set foot in a church. I see this as such a common response from evangelical parents of gay kids. It's as if they're looking at their gay kid and they say, in fact, sometimes they do and say, you have destroyed my dream for you. We have this way of, of really making this about us and about our pain. When in reality, as the parents of gay kids, it's impossible for us to even begin to understand the pain that they're dealing with. If you're really looking to reach into the LGBT community, the first thing to do is not look at it as the LGBT community, just look at it as people who, who need Christ. Debates about sexuality and gender are not just about issues. They are about people, beautiful people. These debates, they're about my friends. And so again, this is a four-week study. It started last Wednesday night, but certainly not too late for you to join us. This is not something that you have to sign up for. Uh, just simply show up this Wednesday and participate with us. And I will tell you this, you know, I, I posted this trailer on Facebook last week, and, and I've had some interesting responses just to the posting of the trailer. Uh, but I will say this, we had, I, I, we had an excellent study on Wednesday night. And you don't have to agree with me to be able to have an excellent study. You don't have to have the exact same perspective as me to have an excellent study. But I promise you this, you show up on Wednesday and we will make you think. And we will make you look into your Bible. And we will make you really consider how we balance truth, which we stand on, with grace when it comes to relationships with other human beings. Amen, church? And so this is an excellent study. Here are a couple of things we're going to be covering in this study. Week one last week was, Dear Church, I'm Gay. Week two, The Jesus Way, How Jesus Balanced Truth and Grace. Week three, What is Marriage? How do Christians respond to changing cultural norms? And week four, What does the Bible say about same-sex relations? And so, again, if this is a topic you think you might be interested in, I hope that you will join us for these remaining three weeks. We meet over in the new education building in what we call the Lake Room. And uh, you are invited and you are welcome to come and we would love for you to be a part of that. Now, 
Along with that, I want to mention that in about three weeks, we will be starting a new semester, a spring semester of Bible studies on Wednesday night. We're offering four classes. The first is Starting Point, which is for new and non-members. And this is a class that I teach. And uh, if you haven't participated in it, we want you to start there. That's why it's called Starting Point. Uh, we also have a study on the book of Psalms that's going to be led by uh, Paul Kirsch. We have a study called Intentional Grandparenting, which will be led by Chris Moore, our senior adult pastor. And then we have a ladies Bible study on the book of Esther, led by Kathy Cohen and Sherry McBee. All four of these classes are going to be excellent. We finally have the space to do them. But here's what I want to say to you. Listen to me, church. You, OBC is not a sign-up church. We are a wait to the last minute and keep our options open church, right? <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. It doesn't come from your pastor. But somehow you're like, no, I don't think I will sign up for that. But then you'll show up, right? You'll show up and say, where's my class? Where's my space? Where's my material? No, it's not going to work. There is a limited number of spaces in each class, and you need to sign up. How do you do that? You go online, oakdalebc.com, and there is a registration there for each one of the classes. Please go and get signed up. Please don't come to me in three weeks and say, but I wanted to be in the grandparenting class, and, but they're saying there's not enough room. And I'm going to say, what am I going to say, church? Just go ahead. What am I going to say? I told you so. That's exactly right. I told you so. All right. So I want to encourage you. We want you to come and be a part of this. This is such a good thing. We had over 200 people here last Wednesday night. We're enjoying dinner together. We're studying God's word together. Our children's ministry and our youth ministry are growing. And if you're missing out on Wednesday night, you are missing out. So let me encourage you to come and be a part of that. Now, this morning, as we continue really with our worship, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper, which you can see the Lord's Supper table here in front of me. And the Lord's Supper is always a very special time here at OBC. We work really hard to make sure that it is a special time here at OBC. And so one thing that, that you will just almost never really experience is the Lord's Supper being tagged on to the end of a service, like, like an afterthought. Instead, what we've kind of committed to do is that when we take the Lord's Supper, we take it seriously and we make it the whole thing. And that's what we're doing this morning. And so everything from this point forward that happens is a continuation of our worship. And we continue that worship through the observing of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to do some teaching with you this morning. We're going to take some time to prepare our hearts this morning. And then we will participate in this very special experience that we have the privilege of being a part of. Before I do that, I want to take a little bit of time. I want to talk about some of the background elements that are associated with the Lord's Supper that we may not even be aware of that could maybe give us a little greater appreciation for the significance of the Lord's Supper. And, and I'll be honest with you, as your pastor, that is one of the things that's really important to me. I always want us to come to the Lord's Supper and to come away from the Lord's Supper with an appreciation for the significance of the Lord's Supper. And so to begin, let's, let's just talk a little bit about the preparation that was required before what we call the Last Supper in the Bible could even take place. I want to read to you from Matthew 26, verse 17. We'll have the scripture I'm going to share with you on the screen behind me. It says this in Matthew 26, 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread... The disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? Now, the Jewish calendar was filled with religious celebration, and many of them involved feasts. There was the feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot, which was to commemorate God's provision at harvest time. And, and it wouldn't be wrong to think of it a little bit like our Thanksgiving, okay? We are thankful for all that you have provided to us, God, Shavuot. The Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, was to celebrate God's provision to the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, if you remember the story from the Old Testament. 
The Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, was the highest holy day where they had a sacrifice which was offered in the Holy of Holies to take away the sins of the people. And so there were many feasts and there were many celebrations that took place throughout the year. But probably the most central feast to the Jewish year was the eight-day celebration known as the Feast of Passover or Pesach which was a reminder of the way that God delivered Israel from slavery and oppression in Egypt. The feast centered around unleavened bread, which was a reference to the type of bread the Israelites were to take with them as they left Egypt in haste. Throughout Scripture, leaven is actually used to represent sinful influence. Sinful influence which is why God told the Israelites to leave Egypt and all the evil associated with that place and to not take any leaven with them to use in their bread to make it rise. And on the surface, it seems like such a strange request or a strange command to give. And yet there was amazing, beautiful symbolism in what God was telling them to do or to not do. And as a a reminder of that event, every year, every year after that, the Israelites would remove all leaven from their home, which was a task that took time and it took effort. And they were to eat only unleavened bread for the seven days of the feast. Each household was also to select a lamb which would be sacrificed and and it would be eaten on the 10th day of the first month before the actual Passover meal. Which means that in all likelihood, sometime after Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, the disciples had to secure a lamb, which would be sacrificed, cooked, and eventually eaten during the Passover meal. Now, in Matthew 26, they're trying to get everything together, everything else that needed to be done, they were trying to get it together for the Passover meal, which was going to take place, think about this, on Thursday night, okay? And their to-do list would have included having the lamb slaughtered by a priest at the temple, which could only be done between the hours of 3 and 5 in the afternoon. So there were a lot of, of rules and there were a lot of guidelines for how everything had to be done. They would have had to buy unleavened bread, wine, and bitter herbs for the Passover meal. Also, because they didn't live permanently in Jerusalem, they needed a place to have their meal. And so they asked Jesus, what should they do? And that's the verse that I read to you. Jesus' answer must have really puzzled them. Listen to this. This is verse 10 through 12 in the book of Luke. So different uh, gospel, but the same story. Luke 22, verses 10 through 12. And Jesus replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. Isn't that strange that Jesus would give that kind of direction to them? You can almost imagine their response. Okay, so you want us to go into the city and find a stranger carrying a pitcher of water. This is how we start. This is what we're supposed to do to get ready for the Passover meal. What's hard for us to realize, there's actually, again, some symbolism here because it would have been unheard of, listen to me, for the average Israelite man to be carrying such a domestic item. They would not have done that under normal circumstances, which means that the man carrying the pitcher was almost certainly a servant or a slave. And again, not someone the disciples would have been expected to talk to. Still, the disciples eventually did what Jesus instructed. Verse 13 says, They went off to the city and they found everything just as Jesus had said, And they prepared the Passover meal there. Now, maybe you ask, okay, why do I need to know all of this? What does this have to do with anything? Well, the point that I'm trying to make 
is that there was a significant amount of preparation required before they could participate in the very first Lord's Supper. Do you see that? That there was more to it than just simply show up and do it. And, and you know what? We may be a little bit tempted to do that as Christians today. I mean, do you realize there's been some preparation that has taken place for the Lord's Supper? In fact, because of the weather and last week being canceled, it's been prepared twice for you. I, seriously. Okay, but it's not just a matter of just show up and, oh, there's the table and there's the cloth and there's the elements underneath it. I mean, some, some preparation took place before you guys ever got here. And there are some things that had to be done that you'll never know anything about. And now we just show up and do it? I don't think so. I don't think so. So the question that I have for you this morning is this. How do we prepare to spend this time with God? Because that's what we're about to do. We already are in God's presence, but we're about to spend time with him in a very unique and special way. Do you understand that? We read in the Bible that there was actually a problem very early on in the, in the church with people not preparing for the Lord's Supper in an appropriate way. One church located in Corinth was known for making a mockery out of the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul says this to them in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, but in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done whenever you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. In verse 20, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I will certainly not praise you for this. I think that's the very first come to Jesus meeting. Would you agree? I mean, Paul is laying it on pretty thick. He's telling them, I am not happy with what I hear. I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but I'm hearing about the way you're acting, and I don't like it. And I don't think God likes it. And he goes on in verse 27 to say this. And I mean, this is where it gets serious. He says, so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Now, why would Paul say that? Well, it's because the cup and the bread represent what Jesus did for us on the cross. That is why he says that each person needs to stop and examine themselves before they eat of the bread or drink from the cup. This means that just as important as buying the groceries for the meal or finding a place where we can eat it is preparing our hearts for this reminder of what Jesus has done for each one of us. So let's take some time right now to do that. I'm going to ask the band to come on back and we're going to pray. So let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. Let's just begin right now to work through the process, the experience of repentance. Right now, I want to ask you to ask God to show you the sin in your life and in your heart that needs to be dealt with this morning. That may not be something that you're very used to doing. It may not be something that you're comfortable with, or, or this may be something you're very comfortable with. But in sincerity, in humility, ask him, God, will you show me the sin that I need to deal with this morning? And as 
those images probably start coming into your mind. Images of relationships, images of things that you have done, maybe images of things that you should have done but didn't. As God begins to bring those images to your mind and to your heart of sin, can you first just acknowledge them? Sometimes we want to be defensive. We want to say, no, that wasn't my fault, God. No, that's not what I meant, God. But instead, can you just throw all of that out and just say, yes, God, I see it. I get it. You're right. And I was wrong. As you acknowledge your sin before God, the next step, the Bible says, is to repent of that sin. And that's more than just saying, I'm sorry. It's more than just asking for forgiveness. To repent is to turn and to go in the opposite direction. So I want you to take a moment right now and much, much deeper than saying, sorry, God, forgive me, God. I want you to take a few minutes and I want you to think about what it would take to walk away from this sin as well as to replace that sin with things that are pleasing to God in your life. Begin to do that right now. For some of us, maybe anger is something that we struggle with. What would be the opposite of anger? That I could ask God to help me replace that anger with in my life. God, will you give me much more grace and patience so that I don't become so angry with people. If it's worry, God, will you replace that worry with dependence on you? I want to trust you when I'm stressed and when I'm feeling anxious. Whatever it is, Ask God to show you what needs to replace that sin in your life. And then make a commitment to it. God, I see my sin. I see what needs to replace it. And I commit to doing that. I want to go in the opposite direction of my sin and I want to replace it with things that glorify you and please you. And I commit to this with you, God. this point 
it's time to ask for forgiveness. So you have asked God to show you your sin. You've acknowledged that sin. You've made a commitment to repent of that sin. And now we ask for forgiveness. And understand that that forgiveness cost Jesus his body and his blood and his life. That is the cost of my disobedience to you, God. And I recognize that even as I ask for that which I do not deserve. Forgive me, Father, for these sins. take a moment right now with confidence that you have been forgiven and give thanks to him. Let me challenge you right now in your own heart and mind to say a prayer of thanksgiving, of thanksgiving, of thankfulness to him. Do it now. Our deacons are going to come and begin to prepare the table. More preparation. Prepare to be able to serve you. And as they do that, let me continue to talk about the Lord's Supper and, and how it originated. We call it sometimes the Lord's Supper, but there's another word for it. Can you think of what we might say? We are taking communion, right? The reason that we call it communion is that Jesus explains to his disciples that he will not commune with them again until after his resurrection. And so as they take that last meal, they did not understand that this was going to be the last meal. And he's trying to explain it to them. Now the word commune means to have intimate fellowship. And, and that is what the disciples were experiencing, again, for the last time before Jesus' death. And so it, became, it came to be known as communion in the early church, but this time of intimate fellowship actually led to some confusion throughout Christian history. In the early days of the church, did you know that Christians were actually accused of cannibalism? I'm serious. Because of the way they described communion. Think about it. Eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus. Can you see where the confusion might have come in? Today, some traditions believe that the bread literally becomes the body of Jesus in some supernatural way. Others believe that there is a supernatural presence around the bread, if not actually in it. But we take the perspective that Jesus was using a metaphor in the same way that he said, I am the true vine, or I am the door. He says that the bread represents my body, which will be sacrificed for you. So every time you eat it, remember what I have done for you. 
and you can know that I am there with you and you are with me. And in this way, in this moment, we commune together. Isn't that kind of beautiful? He took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Like sheep have gone astray, each one of us turning away, and the Lord has laid on him the sin of us all. Pierced for my rebellion, crushed for my sin, he was led away justly condemned and the Lord has laid on him the sin of us all he bruised for my transgressions he bore the sins of many he intercedes for and the Lord has laid on him the sin of a soul. Treated harshly, he never said a word. Like a lamb to the slaughter. And the Lord has laid on him the sin of a soul. a little bit of instruction about the bread first of all um, we all the bread that we use in Lord's Supper is always gluten free for those who have an allergy and who need that we want you to be sure that you know that secondly uh, when we pass out the elements we pass them out to everybody who will take them and I want to say this to you if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and believe me when I say that you're not the only one and you would not be the only one to be here in the, during the Lord's Supper. And you are always welcome to not take the elements. 
or if you want the elements, you are welcome to take them. But understand something. When we eat this bread in just a second, as Christians, we are eating this bread and we are symbolizing the communion with a Savior who allowed his body to be broken for us. If you're not a believer and you eat this bread, you are simply eating a cracker with very little taste. Amen? And so just know that. Just understand that. That's nothing more than that for you. But for those who believe, it's a, a very important symbol. Now, in traditional Jewish celebration of the Passover meal, it was customary for the head of the family to break the bread, hand it out, and then to say a blessing over it in Hebrew. And it would have sounded something like this. Baruch Ata Adonai, Elohenu Melech Elohim, Hamosi Lachem Mi Hares. Which means, blessed are you, our eternal God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. That's it. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the body of Christ, the literal bread of heaven, broken and sacrificed for us, that we might experience eternal life with you. Now, in the same way, the Bible says that Jesus took the cup of wine after supper and saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. And as the disciples drank the cup, Jesus added something remarkable and completely unexpected. He said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. Now understand something. The idea of a covenant was a big deal to the Israelites. God had made human history changing covenants in the past with Noah after the flood, with Abraham on Mount Moriah, with Moses on Mount Sinai. And in each case, know that the covenant was sealed with the sacrifice of an animal and the shedding of blood. Hebrew, Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And that is why the cup represents this new covenant that God has made with humanity. In this covenant, we accept what Jesus is offering. Or we turn away and we try to live life on our own without a relationship with him. So when we drink from this cup, we are saying that we accept his work on the cross to wash away the stain of our sin and God sees us then as pure and holy, not because of anything we've done, but entirely because of what God has done by sacrificing his son on our behalf. We'll pass out the cup. would be hopeless without your goodness I would be desperate without your love slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross and you have your kindness you chased me down when I was lost with your blood you
traditional Jewish celebration of the Passover meal, it was also customary for the head of the family to take the cup and to say a blessing over it in Hebrew, and it would have sounded something like this, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Helem, Bore Pri Hagafen, which means blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who makes the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the blood of Jesus, which was shed for us, covering our sin and making redemption possible for us. We drink to remember what Jesus did. Now, I mentioned earlier that the Apostle Paul admonished the church at Corinth for the way that they were approaching the Lord's Supper, and I told you that the main problem was their treatment of the poor in the context of the supper. And so to make sure that we never repeat that mistake, at OBC we developed a tradition years and years ago where at the conclusion of each celebration of the Lord's Supper, we can collect a benevolence offering, 100% of which goes directly to those in financial need, both inside and outside of the church. I, I want you to understand there is no pressure for anybody to participate in this, but if you would like to contribute, our deacons will be stationed at the exits this morning and they will collect any offering that you would like to give. Deacons, you guys can now go to the back. And in the meantime, uh, we're going to have our missions pastor, Micah Compton, come and lead us in prayer. And after Micah prays, we're going to conclude the service just with one more time of celebration and thanksgiving, singing King of Kings. Micah, will you close this out? Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for this reminder of what your son did on the cross for us. Let this meal always help us reflect on our sin and the mercy that you poured out over us. Not a spilling of blood so that we could have forgiveness for our sins. God, let us go out from here being reminded of that and living out of that. That we not only forgive, we forgive ourselves because of what you've done. We live in that forgiveness and we forgive others. I gotta pray that throughout this week we continue this worship we reflect on the sins that we have committed and that we bring them to you confess them to you think about what we can do differently to replace that and then to ask for forgiveness 
for you knowing that you will and that you have. In Christ's name, amen. Will you stand with us as we sing King of Kings? God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.